it seems fortuitous that we introduce the subject of courage for this month because this week brings us the Jewish holiday of Purim, which is a very fun, happy, silly holiday which involves a mandate for adults to do a great deal of drinking and which involves a story which is all about courage. The story of Purim begins sort of before the story really gets going with the ascension of King Ahasuerus, who might or might not be the historical King Xerxes, to become leader of Persia. Now at this time the Jews were under the rulership of Persia, um, and by becoming ruler of Persia, Ahasuerus became ruler of the Jews. We'll get to that in a moment. The important thing to know at the beginning is that he throws a ginormous party, a huge party, goes on for 180 days, and because that's not enough, he has another week-long party in his hometown for special guests. So after all of this drinking and carousing, King Ahasuerus says to his queen Vashti, I want you to dance before my guests. Now, I do not have the cultural competency to know what exactly it meant for Vashti to dance for his guests, but I know there had been a lot of drinking for a lot of days, and what I know is the story says that Vashti refuses. And for that act of integrity and bravery, the king has her unclear, maybe exiled and maybe executed. One way or another, there is no longer a Queen Vashti. And so Ashvarath needs a new queen, and in the logic of his advisors, he figures out what he needs to have as a beauty contest. And so he has a beauty contest for the whole nation to choose himself the loveliest possible new replacement bride. And one of those contenders is a young Jewish woman named Esther, who lives with her cousin Mordecai. And Mordecai figures that it would not be a bad thing for the Jews to have a little inside at the palace, and so he sends off Esther to audition. And such is Esther's beauty that she wins. She becomes Queen Esther. Now, there are things that you need to know about Mordecai. For one thing, it turns out we will need to know later that right about this time, Mordecai discovers a plot against the king. There are castle guards who are plotting to kill the king, and he overhears them, and he reports them, much to the sort of non-specific appreciation of the authorities. It is also true at the time that the king's new advisor is a man named Haman, who really doesn't like the Jews. And he especially doesn't like the Jews because of Mordecai. Because Mordecai, amongst all the other Jews, refuses to bow down before Haman. Which just makes Haman absolutely nuts. And he can't stand the Jews, and he can't stand Mordecai in particular, and it's gnawing at him, and finally he goes to the king and he says, I've got this little problem, I hope you don't mind if I take care of it. And the king's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, fine. And so, Haman decides that he's going to have the Jews basically eliminated. I should tell you that when you tell the story on Purim in a Jewish community, you're supposed to make so much noise when you hear the name of Haman that you blot out his name. So if you want to have your noisemaker, and every time I say, Haman, bad guy, not at all nice. Um, so Mordecai, being the in-the-know kind of man that he is, finds out that Haman has made this plot. He's cast lots to decide just what day it is he's going to off all the Jews, and he's decided on the 13th of Adar. And so Mordecai sends a message to Esther in the palace and says, you've got to do something about this. Our people are going to be killed. And go talk to the king. Do something. And Esther writes back and says, Ah, uh, hello, it is a death sentence to approach the king without permission. And we all know what happened to the last queen. And I've been in the palace for 30 days now, and the king has not called me in, so I don't really think that's a good idea. And Mordecai writes back and says, 
yeah, if you don't do anything, the Jews will be saved, but you and your household will perish. And who knows but what you have come to be royalty for just such a time as this. And so Esther says, okay, I want everybody to fast, I'll fast, we're going to get ready, we're going to do this thing. And so after three days of fasting, Esther screws up her nerve and she goes to approach the king very meekly and asks if she might possibly have an audience, and the king happens to be in a good mood, and he raises his scepter as an indication that she may speak, and he says, what would you like? And he, she says, well, if it please your majesty, I'd very much like to invite you and your advisor Haman to a wine feast. Would that be okay? <laughs> king says, sure, fine, great idea, let's do it. And so Esther gets herself ready for the feast. But before the feast ever happens, that night the king can't sleep. And so he calls one of his advisors, who presumably no longer can sleep in his own self, over with his book of the record of the events of the court. And he says, read to me, this will make me fall asleep for sure. And so the king hears of how Mordecai has foiled the plot against his majesty. And he asks, has anything been done for this man? No, no, we just kind of said thank you. So he figures, well, really, Mordecai deserves some kind of a reward. And so a little while later, he sees Haman, who is coming to the king to ask for special permission to get rid of Mordecai. And the king says to Haman, what would you do for a man whom the king wishes to honor? And Haman, thinking that the king is talking about him, says, Well, I think that man should be dressed in the king's own robe and placed on the king's own horse and ridden through the streets while someone proclaims this is what happens with a man that the king wishes to honor. And the king says, Great idea! That's perfect! That's what I want you to do for Mordecai. Eh, Mordecai, the Jew. But the king has said it. Nothing he can do to stop it. So Haman makes the king's wishes known, all the while grinding his teeth and biting his nails and just furious. He sets up a gallows so that Mordecai can be hung because he just can't. He just can't. So the king and Haman come to the feast prepared by Esther, who I might note the king does not know is a Jew. And they have a lovely time, and the king says, so, my dear, is there anything I can do for you? And she kind of casts down her eyes, and she says, well, you know, I'd love you to come to another feast. And then I have a little something that I want to ask of you. Lovely, says the king. Lovely, says Haman. Wonderful. So, with the gallows outside the window, they come to the second feast. And at the second feast, Esther informs the king about the plot against the Jew and the plot against Mordecai and that his own trusted advisor is the one who wants to do in his bride and all of her people. And the king is furious and he orders Haman hung on the gallows that Haman had set up for Mordecai and the queen is honored and the Jewish people are saved. It's a complicated story and a pretty interesting one because the courage comes from the women, which is always fun to see. And you have to love Queen Vashti and her integrity and her determination and her clarity of purpose of saying, no, I will not, this is unacceptable. And you can't help noticing that that's not the act of courage that really works. The act of courage that saves the Jews, that is effective, comes from Esther who is working within the system, 
who's willing to flatter and cajole, who's willing to use her good looks for a certain amount of favor and attention. Esther isn't nearly as bold and forthright as Vashti, but she's certainly brave, and in the face of possible execution, she does step forward to do what she can do. But she does it in the way that she knows she can do it. She uses her particular gifts, her particular ability, her particular knowledge to make a change in a way that is subtle, gentle, clever. And I can't help thinking that maybe there's a lesson for all of us in that notion of courage and that notion that what is asked of us is not necessarily the boldness that will get us put on the chopping block, but the wisdom and the discretion to really examine what is it we can do, what is it that we have that we can use to make change. I think that notion of what you can use from inside the palace is maybe a useful one for those of us who are engaged in anti-racism work, particularly for those of us who might be white and in places of privilege, and maybe are not the ones who belong in the die-ins, in the spotlights, but the ones who need to be examining what is it that I can do with my privilege to make a change? What is it that I have, the ability to be listened to by people in power, the ability to present myself as someone with a voice that they're used to listening to? What is it that I have with my education, with my ability to be articulate? What is it that I can do with my financial resources that might just be effective? And that's not to say that there isn't a place for bold and direct action, but if it happens that you are someone inside the palace, it's worth noting that perhaps you have come here for such a time as this. That for each of us, whatever our station, our gifts, our abilities, there is a place for courage. There is a calling. There is a way that we can make change. A way that we can know that we are here for just such a time as this.